so hard memorizing, learning scripture from the book of Exodus, and quizzing. So if you have been a part of quizzing, kids, I want you to come up here. Some of you have your trophies with you. We're going to make a line here. I would love for you guys to clap for these kids. They have worked so hard learning scripture, memorizing all about the book of Exodus. So we've got Jacob and Zyking, Dante, Adeline, Mason, Sophia, and Riley. So let's give them, oh, and Maya, here she comes. <laughs> Don't forget them. Okay, let's give them a round of applause. All right, you guys can go be seated. Thank you for coming up here. All right, well, before we get started for worship today, I want to read a passage from Mark chapter 9, verse 50. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Let's worship. From the earth to the sky, let it rise, let it rise. From the dark into light, now alive, now alive. We are here to lift you up, here to sing a song of love, here to give you, God, what you are. Worship belongs to God. Amen. We actually just started, oh, you guys can be seated just for a little bit. I have a few announcements for us, but we actually just started a new Sunday school class with the third through fifth and then uh, pre-K through kindergarten. But I'm so excited. The older kids, we're talking about our faith and what we believe and who we believe in. So I love this song we just sang about worshiping our God and it's all for him. Um, I just have a couple of announcements this morning. On Wednesday, we had our first fundraiser to send kids to camp. 
and we raised $577. So I just want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for coming out. If you didn't have the chance to come out, I have fantastic news. You still get a chance to help our kids get to camp. So back here by the nursery, the toddler nursery, there's a bulletin board that has all kinds of colorful envelopes. We are going to do a fundraiser, an envelope fundraiser. So you just take the envelope off. It has a cash amount on it. You stick that amount in your envelope and then put it in the offering plate. And our hope is to be able to send 10 kids to camp. So the amount of envelopes back there, if we raise, if we put money in all of them, we can send every kid to camp. So help us out, okay? We're looking forward to it. Um, our next annou announcement is that tonight is Valley View and Beyond. At 6 p.m., um, there will be fried chicken. We just ask that you bring a side. And then Dawn and Evie Gardner, um, who have been serving in East Africa, will be here sharing with us about what has been going on in that part of the world. And then on May 8th, we have a garden party um, for all women. So mother, daughter, sister, um, we encourage you to come out May 8th, 3 to 5 p.m., um, and it'll be a wonderful time together. Pastor Gavin has a very important announcement um, for us as a church, and so he's going to share that last one with you. Hey, uh, good morning. I'm so glad to be here with you. I was sorry to miss you last week. It felt, it feels like it's been forever since I saw you, but I'm glad you're here. I want to let you know, we had some slides presented, but I messed them up, so you don't get the slides for this. We'll do slides next week. Um, we've been talking for a few months now with the board and with the staff how to provide the best experience, especially for those who may be connected online. And what we came up with was an app. Yeah, a church app. So believe it or not, if you use a smartphone, you can connect to Valley View with your phone. Now, I want to tell you right away as a disclaimer, if you don't use a smartphone, that's okay. We're still going to give all the information we've always given. We're still going to send the emails and phone calls when appropriate and have other ways of giving and things that we've always done. Um, but we're also adding a new step. And we hope that will give you a, a chance to be more connected with your church family as we continue to uh, come back off of this pandemic time and go from there. So I want to tell you really quick, if you don't know what I'm talking about in the next 30 seconds, find a millennial after church. That's someone, if you're a millennial, would you raise your hand? I'm a millennial. I'm about the oldest millennial that we have probably in the church, or Jill might be. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm just teasing. So if you're a millennial, expect someone to come help you, but otherwise... You can take out your phone and go to where you send text messages, right? So if you go to your phone where you send text messages, and the number you type in is 77977, right? So 77977. And then in the message, what you're sending to that number, you're going to put in uppercase, lowercase, doesn't matter, no spaces, VV for Valley View, V, V, Victor, Victor, A, sorry, I messed it up. V, V, N, A, Z, V, V, Naz, like our website. V, V, Naz, uh, app, A, P, P, okay? If you don't know what I'm talking about or if you're not interested, that's just fine. If you do know what I'm talking about, send that message away. You'll get a link um, to download the app, and we'll share with you different things you can do from time to time. What I would tell you right now, if you never really tried giving online, there's a really simple way to do that. Um, we heard some voices, uh, people asking if, you know, is my offering safe when I give it at the back of the room? We're still not sure if we're ready to pass the plates, just considering COVID and things. So what we've done um, is we've put up an offering uh, box in the back of the sanctuary. No matter which door you go out, if you go out these doors that we're used to using here, you'll have a box on either side where you can drop your offering. Um, but for now, uh, Again, you can send that text message away, VV NAS app to 77977, um, or you can find a millennial after church, myself included. Um, but uh, we'll be sharing with you different things you can do uh, throughout the weeks and months ahead uh, with that, and hopefully that'll be something that you enjoy uh, connecting through, um, and we'll go from there. But uh, for now, let's turn our, our hearts and our spirits back to worship. I'm just going to say a quick word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we can be gathered in this place. We thank you that no matter if times or technology or method 
may change and adapt and evolve, Lord. We thank you that you are the same God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Joseph, the God who sent us your son, Jesus Christ, and Lord, the God who comes to us again and again, able to meet our needs, call us closer to you and give us your grace. We give you this morning, Lord, again, and ask that you would be with us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
sinner now I sing For the God who died came back to life And everything has changed Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Deliver and redeem. Eternal life is ours. Oh, praise His name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Your tears of joy, I'll lift my voice to everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is
And so we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name we pray. morning again. It occurs to me that we usually say Christ is risen. If we have any grammar, um, I don't know, grammar, sticklers for grammar out there, they might be wondering, why don't we say Christ has risen? I mean, that was an event that happened in history. We say Christ has risen. Um, we usually say Christ is risen. And, and the reason we do that is because the fact that Christ is risen isn't a one-time event. That's a daily event that we experience in our heart and life every single day. So Christ is risen is something that we can say in the continuous present tense. If you're not a grammar person, maybe that doesn't matter to you, but every once in a while, I, some, like, some things like that stand out to us, and I think they make sense. Before I um, get into the Scripture passage for this morning, um, I want to tell you that someone came to me and said, I'm not a millennial. Well, I was dealing with a problem with our feed there for one second. I think it's all uh, fi uh, fixed now. But someone said, you know, you could easily just tell people to go to uh, the, the app store and just type in VV Naz uh, Valley View Nazarene and it would download. I mean, it would come right up. If you know our logo, that'll work for you as well. And we tested it and it works both in, in Google Play Store and, and the Apple App Store. They assured me, those the developers assured me that wouldn't work, but it does apparently. So anyway, um, be free to do that. The reason I'm telling you that again is because one thing you can do if you're interested in doing this, and if you're not interested, uh, no offense will be taken, but you can click on home and you click on worship services and there'll be sermon notes in there if you're interested in following along. Um, and we'll make sure there's an option for sermon notes for those who do not care to have a smartphone or don't care to have the app. But we'll make that available in the future. Um, and again, this being the first time, I would imagine many people don't have access to it yet anyway. But our, our big idea, the thing that we want, um, that I believe the Lord wants you to know today, is that we were created as human beings with the purpose of God's good plan um, setting forth in the universe and in our lives up until today. God created us for the purpose that we would bear fruit. But if we're going to bear fruit, we have to abide in Christ. Amen? So last week, Jill spoke um, about uh, the Good Shepherd, and that was one of the I Am statements. This week, the passage that, that we're going to read is also an I Am statement. These are important statements of Jesus. They, they resemble the I Am statement that God gave to Moses. And if you remember, do you, do you, I, well, this isn't Sunday school. I won't make you call it out. But if you remember, Moses uh, is walking through the desert. He's been out there for a while. He's wandering around, and then he arrives at a, a burning bush that is somehow on fire, but it's not being consumed, and, and he has this conversation with God. And as they're conversing, he says, so God is sending him back to Egypt that he may free God's people from slavery. And he, and he, he says, well, tell me first your name. Give me your name, and with that name, I'll go back to your people, and I'll be able to convince them that such and such God is sending me. And God says, you don't get to know my name. You can't know my name by knowing how it's pronounced. My name is I am who I am. I, or it's equally good to translate it, I will be who I will be, Yahweh. That's, that's what Yahweh means. I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. You can't know God by knowing His name. You have to know God as you walk with God, experience life with God, put your trust in God, and then God's self will be revealed to us. And so when Jesus is, is appearing, um, speaking to the disciples at some times, speaking to larger groups, He says, I am so-and-so. He is revealing to us more about who He is. We can't know Him in the traditional way, so Jesus is revealing Himself to us. And this statement that He's going to use here in, in John chapter 15 is, I am the true vine. And as I was going, preparing the Scripture and, 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 and looking at that, I could not help but be filled with the image of a vine from my childhood. I grew up in, in San Antonio, and, and the weather doesn't get too cold there, and I think it snowed in 85, and then it snowed uh, in 2021, so it's been a while. 
um, but I remember there was this honeysuckle vine that we, we had a large wooden deck out behind our house. It was huge. And, and, and I would play in and, or on and under and around the deck and in the yard and go nuts. And I would always be chasing lizards. I haven't seen a lot of lizards here, but we had a bunch of lizards. And part of me thinks that it's because it's not so cold. I don't know if that's true. But, but these lizards would always run to this honeysuckle vine and hide. And it used to make me angry because I knew as soon as a lizard gets into the honeysuckle vine, he was gone. I wasn't going to be able to find him. There's too many branches and leaves and twisting and turning. And every once in a while, you think, oh, I found him. He's right here. And you put your hand on there, and, and it wasn't him. It was just a twig or something. And, um, but for the, something that would help me, something that worked on my, on my behalf or in my favor, is as fall came, those leaves would start to shrivel up and fall off. But those dumb lizards still thought they were hiding in there. And it got really easy to catch the lizards around fall time. But, but I spent a lot of time dealing with this. And as my dad was teaching me how to garden and, and how to mow the lawn and things like that, he would say, hey, go, why don't you go trim up this vine? And I would go to the vine, sure, yeah, I'll trim this up. And I would start clipping on this vine. And then, you know, a few days later, we'd notice, I, trip, I trimmed over here, but all this stuff over here is dead. And he'd be like, what did you do? You didn't understand how a vine works. You can't just clip crazy over here and expect that the rest of it is not going to pay the price or have consequences. The vine is a unique image of what God is doing in binding us together as a people and binding us together with Him. We are interconnected. With that said, I'd like us to look at John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, He prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it uh, abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. And this is the word of the Lord. You know, Jesus comes and and he gives this word to the disciples, and he's done it right after he's told them he's going away. Sometimes you think Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. He just told us he's going away. There's another one coming, but now they're supposed to abide or just really remain That's what it means to remain in Christ. How can I remain in Christ if he's going away? What does this mean? It would have been, I would guess, a little bit confusing for the disciples. When he finishes uh, this passage, he speaks about abiding in his love. And he even confirms for his followers, yeah, I know this is confusing, but if you just abide in me, In my teachings, in my ways, if you are close with me, do not worry, you will be close to the Father. I've dealt with people and talked with people who thought they were too far from the Lord to be able to go to God. Somehow they would be struck dead or somehow that, that their prayers couldn't be heard because of whatever reason, whatever sin, whatever thing that they've done, whatever just complacency that has kept them from the Lord in the past, people sometimes feel as though there's no relationship there, there's nothing that I can do. And the easy answer that Christ gives is that, hey, that's okay. If you just know me, I'll take care of you. I got you. I will speak to the Father. If you just, if you just have a relationship with me, if you're close to me, if you remain in me or abide in me in my ways, you have nothing to worry about. I can make sure that you have that audience or that conversation or relationship with the Father, because knowing me is the same as knowing my Father. And that's good news. 
But you know, the, the image of the vine, I was speaking about a honeysuckle vine in my example, but the vine for Israel would have really only meant one thing. The vine was a grapevine. We know how important uh, wine was to them in their culture, and, and, and they didn't eat much of the fruit, but that would have been considered something for very wealthy people. The vine has, for Israel's entire history, would have been very important to them. It's a symbol of God's future planning and of God's future care. There's times when they were in the exile, and God said, guess what, I'm sending you to a place or I'm sorry, they were in the wilderness, and God said, I'm sending you to a place um, where land flows like milk and honey. You've heard this. And other times he said, I'm sending you to a place where there are homes that you did not build, there are vineyards that you did not plant, and there are wells that you did not dig. So there's this image that, that there's, you're going to have everything you need. There's going to be vineyards already there because vineyards take time. You can't just go plant some seeds and expect in a few years to have something to, to uh, some kind of crop from there. It would take a long time. So the fact that God said, don't worry, the vineyards are already there. You're just going to walk into the place and own it and take possession of it. That was a huge promise. There's also been times in some more prophetic um, judgment against Israel where God has compared them to a vine that needed pruning. And now here we are again, and Jesus has these words, you have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. My Father cuts off every branch that uh, prunes every branch that does not bear fruit. This was a natural part of owning a vine or tending to a vine. If you want it to do well, you have to care for it and, and, and look at the long term. It's not a short-term goal. I'm reminded that in, in Congo, I probably planted something like 60 trees over my time there. Uh, people always chop trees down, and I'd say, hey, um, maybe if I bring trees around, so I was this crazy guy that I would show up at a church to preach and I would have a tree and said, I brought you this tree. I would like you to plant it someplace around the church because everybody chopped the trees down for other needs and other things. And I'd say, this tree is valuable. You're going to come out of church. It's hot in there. You've been sweating. You're going to come out into the shade and into the breeze. And you're going to be saying, I thank the Lord that we have a tree. So please don't chop this down one day. But people would often say, why are you planting trees? You're never going to receive the fruit of this work. Whether it's fruit of shade or the fruit of uh, nice smelling or uh, nice looking flowers, or whether it was something like avocado or mango or orange or any of the number of trees that we would have planted in that time. People would always say, why are you doing that now? You're never going to receive the fruits of that, that labor. You're never going to see that come to fruition. And we'd always, I would always love it when people would tell me that and say, that's okay. There are going to be people who come after me. That's okay. We have children and our children will one day come and stand under this tree and say, hey, I'm so glad that God made a tree here. The image of the vine, and, and as often with agricultural metaphors or messages in Jesus' um, and Misa, in Jesus's teaching is often uh, a future promise. Agricultural metaphors off, also um, bring to mind a dependence upon God. We cannot force a seed that we've planted to do anything. We cannot make it be anything other than it already is. We cannot say, well, we're going to make it go faster. Yeah, we can fertilize and we can prune and make things do better, but we cannot in our own right make a tree grow or a vine grow or anything grow from that, for that matter um, other than what it's already genetically programmed to do. And I know you're thinking, well, pastor, what about grafting? Yes, you got me there. I was staying at someone's house in Tucson um, 10, 12 years ago, and I walked out in the morning, and he had a tree that had oranges on one side, avocados on another side, and grapefruit on another. That was some magical, mystical work that he has done in order to make that uh, take place. It still took time in order to see the, fr the, the, the fruits of that labor. But all this to say, a vine is meant to do one thing. A vine is meant to produce fruit. No matter what that fruit is, what type of vine that is, it has fruit to produce, and that's what it's meant to do. That's the reason why God created it. 
you and me as human beings, we were special crea- uh, creations for God. We weren't just, oh, by the way, we created uh, animals of the land, animals of the sea, birds of the air, creepy crawly things on the ground, and people, and this and this. And No, God created all those things in their time, and then He was done with all of that. God said, now I'm going to create the good stuff. I'm going to create people, and I'm going to put them here to work. And they're going to serve me, and they're going to know me, they're going to love me just as I love them. And we need to realize that when God says that, we, that He is the vine, and we are the branches, we have work to do. There's a prophetical um, statement here saying that every branch that does not bear fruit will be cut off, gathered up, thrown into the fire, and burned. And right away we're thinking, oh no, I need to give more money to the church, otherwise I'm going to be cut off and thrown away. I need to convert more people myself personally, be involved in converting more people. I need to do more works that we consider works and things to be seen. And we, 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 okay, I got to do all these things. But I am fairly certain beyond, beyond any measure of doubt that we're not speaking about in this case, works of converting people, of seeing people be transformed, um, of making the church grow by your own efforts or ministry. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about converts to Christianity. What we're talking about is producing the fruits of the Spirit in us and in other believers, in our community. And the reason I'm certain of that in this case is because we know that we cannot... um, I cannot do anything to see anyone converted. I could be the best. I mean, we can imagine if Billy Graham was alive today and Billy Graham was here and all that Billy Graham would do to preach and we know that he was this amazing preacher and people came to Christ uh, in droves after he spoke. But really, truthfully, if I'm honest, Billy Graham didn't save or convert one single person. The Holy Spirit did that. And the Holy Spirit used a very fruitful vine to bring forth all the fruit and all the promise and all those um, numbers that we might see, all those statistics coming through. But really, Billy did not do that. The great late Reverend Graham did not do that. The Holy Spirit did. The Father did through pruning the vine. Jesus Christ did through giving us His Spirit and giving Himself to us, showing us how to live, and, and, and encouraging us just to abide in Him. So it's not about numbers and our ability to produce. I would say there are some other words of Jesus that really do appear to seem that way if we're not working for Him. If you can remember a time when Jesus passed by a fig tree and He cursed the fig tree, Okay, you don't have any fruit on you, then you'll never get fruit again. And it came back by later, and that fruit or that fig tree was all withered up and dead. In this case, I truly believe what Jesus is talking about, abiding in him, is having a mind like Christ has, having the spirit of Christ. We speak about being cleansed. Jesus says we're cleansed through the words that he has, that he has spoken. Even though there is a sending responsibility nature to what Jesus says, He's also speaking to us about what it means to love God and to love others. And this is why we know that in this case, Jesus is speaking to us about, about our relationship with the Father. And if we can have a good relationship with Christ, our relationship with the Father is perfected. There's different, different types of cleansing that we do or cleaning, really what that word means. Uh, pruning would be an acceptable translation as well. There's different types of that. If you've spent any significant time in Mexico, even if you've just barely gone across the border, what you'll notice is whenever they feel like a tree needs pruning or whether a tree is, is full of insects, what they'll do is they'll chop all the limbs off, all of them. There's nothing left. There's just kind of a trunk and then maybe some of the biggest parts of that trunk where it splits, and then they'll paint halfway up the tree. They'll paint it with lime um, to get rid of insects or, or whatever, and, and that's their method for taking care of their tree. You would say, but it's going to take a long time before that tree recovers from that. Yeah, it's true, but at least it's not going to die. <laughs> it's been cleansed. And if we're to see this metaphor and somehow see us as the branch or somehow see ourselves as that tree, we might be thinking, I don't want to be cleansed. I don't want to be pruned. 
I don't want pieces of my life to be cut off, gathered, and thrown into the fire. That sounds painful. That sounds difficult. But unfortunately, what we know is that following Christ costs us things. Sometimes it costs us comfort. Sometimes it costs us our understanding of what it means to be a powerful or wealthy or well-adapted citizen of wherever we live. But the truth is, if we haven't ever been pruned, we are probably not part of the fruitful good vine that Jesus is talking about here. And we run the risk of being one day clipped, pruned, thrown into the fire. So in a way, Jesus was redefining what religion was. Because the vine is a constant image or synonym for Israel. It's always referring whenever, not always, but usually when Jesus is speaking about the vine or when the Bible, excuse me, is speaking about the vine, it's speaking about Israel. And so Jesus is taking on and reincorporating this image for himself. He is now Israel. And anyone who wants to be a part of Israel, anyone who wants to be a part of God's people, they need just to come to Jesus. And what we know is that's good news because because they were about to open the door for all kinds of Gentiles and all kinds of people who didn't have that Jewish heritage to come in and also be blessed through Jesus Christ. But that could only happen if they came to him first. So Jesus is the vine. If we want to know God and love God and love others as Jesus has told us to, we have to come to him. So the people of God are now those who abide in Christ. Some have been pruned. Some of others have been grafted in, and that's what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 11. We have been grafted in. We, are, we didn't belong to that family, but like that tree that I mentioned in Tucson, somebody took a branch, they made the right cuttings, they put that in there and said, now you belong to this tree. Don't worry. That is good news for each and every single one of us who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The good news is that if we have disconnected ourselves from the vine, if we have somehow refuse to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior in the past, or if we just feel like we have failed, or if in our spirit we haven't exemplified the, the nature and the character and the spirit of Christ, I have good news for you today. You can be grafted in to the vine. You can be again at one with Christ. You can abide in Him if you are willing. There is fruit to be produced. So where Israel has failed, Christ has succeeded and being fruitful for God. And if we tie ourselves to Him, He will also tie ourselves to us and bring fruit. So religion, therefore, is not some sort of club that can be defined um, by things that we do and don't do. Um, it's not a club where we can say, these are places we don't go or where we do go. It's not even a place where we get together and say, yeah, we love each other a lot. We do that. But Christianity is actually a way of life that's defined by love for God and love for others. We cannot live apart from Christ in the same way we can't live apart from each other. If, you, if you've ever been interested in, in, in outer space and, and what the what astronauts do out there and the different things they do, you'll know that a spacewalk is probably one of the most terrifying things that a human being can do. Right? A spacewalk is what they call, um, what they call it when an astronaut gets uh, dressed up in the really big, fancy, thick suit with the oxygen pack on, and they're all closed and checked, and there's absolutely no breach or no hole or anything in that suit, and they get tethered by a cord, um, with extra support and everything that they need on there, but they get tethered by that cord back to the ship or the shuttle or the station, whatever it may be, and then they go out and they might have to do some work. That, to me, would be one of the most terrifying things that you could do. I wouldn't actually mind so much going up in a shuttle, but I would mind being out there with nothing but a few centimeters of cloth between me and outer space. But there are people who do that and train for that, and it's necessary. But one thing that's important is that they are tethered to the ship. They are tethered by that cord. They have to be connected. In the same way, if you've ever looked into the old-timey scuba diving where they had that, just that helmet that they wore, right, and they pumped oxygen into that. There was a movie with that ages ago, but it's the same kind of image. You're going down to the depths. 
You cannot hold your breath for as long as it's going to take you to get down there. So as you go down, just know that this cord is here. And as long as you're attached to the cord, you're okay. You're safe. You're connected. You are tethered. And of course, we've seen sci-fi movies and we've seen perhaps documentaries and things where that does not go as planned and people get disconnected and then the results are disastrous. And the same is true for us. We're out here just walking through life. We feel sometimes that we're disconnected, but as long as we are tethered, as long as we are connected to Christ, as long as we are tethered to the church for which Christ died and gave his life for, as long as we are connected in that way, we are abiding in Christ and there is still hope for us. Life only remains if we are tethered to the vessel or if we are tethered to the vine. The difficult part of this message is that pruning comes before fruitfulness. Sinfulness, selfishness, prejudice, hate, modern idolatry, and so many more are vying for pieces of our lives and what we understand um, as our existence in this world. Those things must be pruned. They must be cut away if we're going to bring fruit, if we're going to bear fruit for our Heavenly Father. So fruitfulness is not directly about winning people to Christ or producing converts. Rather, fruitfulness in the vine is about depending on the Spirit, being one with Christ and one another, so that others may see and taste our fruit and be drawn to the Christian way of life. If you've ever gone through the labor of whether it's a tomato plant, something small like that, or even just flowers or something that you plant and you've if you've, if you've ever been gardening in any, any kind of way, whenever you get to enjoy what has come up, it's a huge blessing. You get excited about it. In the same way, our Heavenly Father, when He is able to bring fruit through us, He is delighted. He is overjoyed. We realize now that we're doing what we were meant to do. Christian people can no more do what Christ has asked us to do, through uh, what God has asked us to do through Christ, than can any other person do, uh, or then we can no more do what Christ has asked us to do than an apple tree give us tomatoes, right? We don't expect tomatoes from an apple tree. We don't expect uh, oranges from from a grapevine. In the same way, Christians have to give the right kind of fruit. And if you're wondering about those, I think you've heard of the fruit of the Spirit, and that's perhaps for another day. I want to bring us, uh, I want to invite the the worship team to come back up as I move into kind of a, a, just a conclusion before we do the, before we take communion together. I think it's a great example of, of being tethered to Christ or abiding in Christ, the fact that we know that we need to come up and we need to take of this uh, bread and of this cup and be fulfilled, or rather be um be pruned, be receiving God's grace. So take care not to disconnect yourself from the vine, and you will bear much fruit. Our existence flows from God's presence. We are nothing if we are not doing what we were meant to do. We were meant for a relationship with the Father and love for others, love for the Father and love for others around us. God is the source of love, of grace, and of transformation. God is a long-term plan maker. If you don't see the fruit in yourself today, I've got good news. You've got time. Not that you would wait to the last moment or to your deathbed to start producing the fruits of the Spirit, but that you would know that God is working in you each and every single day, conforming you if you're willing and if you allow him more into his image. So the image of the vine, of the vine redefines our understanding of work and worth. You were created to be a connected, fruit-bearing, integral part of Christ, of the body of Christ. And when in a few moments after we sing, rather, here's what we'll do. I would rather ask uh, Pastor Brian and Pastor Jill to come up. And as we're singing, go ahead and make your way forward. But I would invite you to, to hold your communion elements. 
and to not take them until we're done, and we have a few words to say, but um, recognize that this isn't just an act that we do. This is one of the things that reminds us that without Christ, we are nothing. Without Christ, we lack the ability to be as He's asking us to be and as He modeled for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us. As we come forward, we, we show our willingness and our, our desire to have a relationship with you and be connected to you, Lord. We don't want to be people who can disconnect ourselves from the vine. We don't want to be people who think that by myself, I can live a holy life or a good life or a Christian life or whatever label we put on it, Lord. We recognize that we are weak and we can do nothing without you. We want to remain in you. We want to abide in you. We want to produce in your image. So, Father, our willingness to do this is symbolized by our willingness to come forward and receive these communion elements. Be with us as we worship you, Lord. Yeah. 
disconnected from the Lord? Have you ever sinned or done something that you felt wasn't right? Have you ever wondered if you were, if you meant anything to God? One of the amazing things about the communion supper is that it reminds us that we belong to him and he to us. The Communion Supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his death, his sufferings, and his resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. It shows forth the Lord's death until he comes. The Supper is a means of grace in which Christ is presented by the Spirit. It is to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to profess anything except for faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ in order to receive these communion elements. And so we we proclaim our faith in him each and every single time that we take of these elements. And also, Christ proclaims his love and affection for us each and every single time that we take of it. Let's remove the the bread portion of it. It's kind of a thin layer there on top. You can do that carefully. And these elements, they seem mundane and and regular, and, and that was the whole point. There was not something amazing and special about the cup or the bread that Jesus blessed and distributed to his disciples. The fact was, it was an everyday part of life, and he gave it to them and gave them new symbols. And so we're gathered here, by God's grace to receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ that was broken for us. May it preserve you blameless into everlasting life. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. And now taking care to not stain your shirt, open it very carefully, the second portion of that expose the juice in the same way that the bread was just a regular part of eating and a regular part of life God took something else that was ordinary the fruit of the vine there is no better image that Christ gives us himself daily than taking these ordinary elements taking this cup he blessed it this is the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ it was shed for each and every single one of us may it preserve us blameless until his coming unto everlasting life. 
Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. Father, we come to you as needy people. We need your presence and your spirit. We come to you as people who confess we've often tried to go it alone. We've often confused what it meant to be fruitful. We've often said we can do this in our own way. Father, we repent of that spirit and that nature today. And we ask that you build up in us a a sense of what it means to be attached to you to be tethered to your life-giving spirit, to know that you have a plan for us to be a fruit-giving, vibrant body of believers, Lord. We don't want to be pruned. We want to be cleansed by your word. God, we pray that even now as we receive this communion, these elements of your table, Lord, that you would transform us, cleanse us, purify us, that we would be of one heart and mind and body and soul and spirit and whatever whatever label we could use, Lord, with you. We endeavor to do everything we can to abide in you, that you may produce fruit in us, Lord. And we will give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory forever and ever. And it is in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the true vine that we pray. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Go in his peace.